So could I just invite up first um, Mr. Yipping, who is representing the European section. Um, as you know, Mr. Yipping is the Vice President of the FCI. So he represent the European section. Could I also invite up Dinky Santos, who will represent the Asia, Africa and Oceania section. He's the President. And Mark Dunn from the AKC, the Vice Chairman. Vice President, sorry, not Vice Chairman. Um, Dr. Pyro, are you around? He's disappeared in this complex somewhere. Okay, so um, gentlemen, um, so how, how this is going to work, I've got, I've got a couple of questions prepared to ask them. Actually, I'm going to come down. A um, couple of questions to ask them and give them an opportunity to respond. And then if we have time, uh, we'll get a couple of questions from the audience. Get a couple of questions from the audience uh, that we could then get them to answer. So the first question that we have for the panel um, is, could you share briefly uh, some of the welfare issues or health and welfare issues that you're facing in your respective sections or in the case of Mark um, country? And could you share with us then um, what these are, what these challenges are? Okay. Um, I, I actually handle Asia, Oceania, and Africa, which is a very complex section because we have, we have uh, very diverse countries. We have some countries of the first world, which is Oceania and Japan. We have third world countries, which are most of Asia. And we have Africa, which is more of a primeval country. They're still starting. So we have very, very diverse uh, problems in our section because of all these different levels of countries we have. Now, I'm sure that um, Australia and Japan are more focused on the BOAS. They should more focus on the BOAS because they don't have problems with street dogs, with, uh, with poverty and everything. Whereas we... I come from the Philippines together with my neighboring countries. We deal with many street dogs. And I think before we deal with BOAS, we should deal with the street dogs and try to, try to lessen, try to find a way to lessen the street dogs in our countries because they keep getting more and more. One day, if today we have 10, tomorrow we have 20. In one year, we have 100. So it just keeps getting more and more. So this is a very, very important for us to do. The street dogs, we have to do something about the street dogs. And then in Africa, it's the same thing. They have the street dogs, and they also eat the dogs. So, so there, we still have to educate them more. We only have a few members in Africa, and slowly they're starting to get better and better. South Africa is a very, very... Very, very. Um, it's a first world country. It's a very, they're very doing very well, but the other countries are still starting up, and uh, they still breed a few dogs. Most of the dogs are imported, but they, most of the people there are still very primeval. So we still have to educate them some more. Thank you. Um, about diversity, Europe, Europe. Um, I think there is not one country the same in Europe, and every country has this a different kind of uh, problem. Uh, the countries in Europe is also the place where I think if something happens in welfare or health, it starts like it's, it's always starting in Europe, in some other countries. And you did hear already two days, these days, to the to the different kind of, of uh, speeches that we have a lot of problems. The Brachiocephalus, where did it start? In Europe. But not only that, it's so many times we are that, that about Austria that it was stroking, that the naked dogs are not anymore allowed, but not only na naked dogs is not allowed, there are also more things what is not allowed to come there. Um, 
how you can solve this. I self think also the media is playing a big role in that. Because there's nowhere, and I looked a little bit to my own country, uh, there's almost nowhere where the media can say and do so much and so much influence as in the Netherlands. So we are always struggling with what is going on. And that is not easy. And not only that, there's one very famous organization who is spread in Europe. And I, I maybe somebody is here, but it is PETA. And they are very spread in Europe. And they have also a lot of secret, I call it secrets, influences. And that we have to deal with, and it is not always easy, because they have connection to the politici, they have connection to the media, and this is not, not so nice to say, but this is almost not to manage, almost not to arrange. Um, I said also already times in, in Europe, when we need much more politicians on our side, lobbyists on our side, and can you do lobbyists alone? No, probably not, not as, as FCI, not as a country individual, but you can do it, a lot of things together. Uh, I'm also happy that uh, also not only the dogs world, but also other kind of world. I'm happy that the FCI signed for a short time ago an agreement with the CATS organization to go together and try to fight together. And this I think we can do with a lot of what we have told in my speech already is that we can do it with the, the, the veterinary, we can do it with, with, with uh, the different kind of kennel clubs, we can do it with everybody to come together and not only this, but all the nutrition. Because I don't know where I use now the name, Roy the Canin, who is written here in the front, is, but I'm sure that this kind of companies has a lot of politicians or lobbyists together. And I think we must find also a way to go there in this direction. So in the, uh, in the United States, I would say if we look back at the last 30 to 50 years, that the improvement in animal welfare is really extraordinary. And, and I'm a numbers guy, so I'll share some numbers here. And, and one of the first numbers is Americans will spend about $90 billion this year just to take care of their pets. So we have, I know the humanization of pets is a challenge for us sometimes, but the benefits of that is when I was a kid, most dogs lived outside. And even in United States, even in rural areas, even hunters, you know, now have their living, living bedrooms. Um, the other thing you'll find is, and again, there's, we can look at this positive and negatively, but from a welfare point of view, strictly, 85% of the dogs in the United States are spayed and neutered. And we, we talked a lot about strays last two days. You know, strays on average across the U.S. are, are fairly rare. Uh, in the large cities in the south and the southwest and unserved communities, you'll find more strays. Um, but even there, because there's so few stray dogs in the north, like Connecticut or Wisconsin, that a lot of those dogs will end up finding homes in other states. We, you know, there's transportation to move um, dogs that can't be adopted in Houston or Tampa Bay to Connecticut or New York. Another really important number is the number of dogs that are ready for adoption. So in the US, According to um, HSUS and ASPCA, there are about 3.5 million dogs available for adoption. And sometimes we wonder, is that a good number? Is that an accurate number? So um, a, a study was commissioned by Mississippi State, University, Mississippi State University, and they came up with about 3.2 million. So that's, it sounds like a lot of dogs, I know, but in the 70s, over 20 million dogs were entering shelters every year. Uh, and now you go to youth, youth and stay real close, sorry guys. If you go to euthanasia rates, uh, 
this year about 650,000 dogs will be euthanized by shelters. But that's down, again, from the 1973, the number was 15 million. So on all these metrics, another thing to think about is um, the fact that the dogs that are euthanized today are mostly, again, outside of some cities in the south, are very old, very ill, and very dangerous because we have very high demand for dogs. I think similar to the EU, we have about 90 million pet dogs, and every year we need about 8 million to replace the dogs that would pass, very similar to numbers that somebody had up for the EU. Now, the other thing happening in the U.S. is that ownership rates continue to increase, so households are owning more dogs per household than ever before, and pop the population of the U.S. the population of the U.S. is still increasing. So overall, dog rates will continue to increase. Now, the bad news for AKC is that we only we only about one point in. All right, is that better? All right, now look at that. All right, so AKC breeders only produce about 1.8 million puppies a year, which is less than 22% of the total demand for dogs in the US. Now, I guess the good part of that is over the last 10 years, that market share has increased dramatically. So uh, AKC in 1993 to 2013, we decreased every year. And since 2013, we have grown every year. And I'll, I'll try to stop here, but I do want to go back to what I said earlier after Gopi's, speak, Gopi's section, that the things he talked about are really some of the things we've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years to try to change the, the conversation and to try to reach out to the public, to educate breeders, all breeders. Anybody who wants to breed can learn from the AKC online for free on how to breed. And we teach, we have courses for judges online. We, we spend, that's where we spend most of our time and, and a lot of money to, to fight back. So, and well, I wanna talk about legislation later, but I will, I'll try to pass it now. Okay, sorry, Dr. Pyro. Um, Dr. Pyro is of course, as you all know, the president of the Americas and Caribbean section. The question was, what are the issues for health and welfare that are being faced in your section? Good afternoon to you all. For me, it is a true pleasure to represent the Americas and the Caribbean for FCI. And indeed, we have had several meetings from the section in which we have talked about this serious problem with some countries. Not all of them, but some. in some we have had very serious problems with governments. And governments, what they've done is copying from another country the rules, believing that since there are dogs on the street, the way to get rid of them would be by making decisions saying that it is an obligation to eradicate dogs by sterilizing all stray dogs. And first of all, in, in the laws, we have people who tend to exaggerate in determining and making their decisions. So they have made the decisions that dog breeding should be suspended, that nobody should breed. They have even passed laws that fortunately haven't been passed because we have fought back and we have had to defend ourselves in the case of Mexico with the Mexican army. They have helped us. All the, all the dogs that belong to the army we register them, we put them the microchip, and we carry out the DNA tests. They have demonstrated something very interesting here. Where you are right now, in this very same place about two months ago, 
the United States gave to Mexico several protection and defense dogs but to detect drugs. And these dogs, they have already finished their work because that was 10 years ago. So we suggested the army and the police forces to conduct an event in which we could donate these dogs to families so that these dogs could be adopted. They were hero dogs. You can't even begin to imagine how successful this was. We had more than 10,000 people, families, who wanted the dogs. And the dogs, they, we were just donating 10 dogs, right? And for this, we made a commitment with the Secretary of Defense, we said that we would look for families that could afford the space to have a dog, a way to feed them, and making sure they had someone to tend to the dog. So anyway, 10 or 15 important determining points. We managed to do this. then. The press came from all over the world. The army were here. The deputy secretary of defense was here. And we thought that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't be able to have everyone. The auditorium was full, out there was full, and the dogs were here, and the people who were going to get these animals were here as well. The, secretary, the deputy secretary had to come in through the back. He, there is a door here at the back, and all of a sudden, he was here. He showed up. Of course, this was an astounding success, and the press made the best coverage of all this. And we got the families who kept the dogs. Believe it or not, all of this helped us change the situation and the mentality of the Senate when it comes to changing the law so that they so that we wouldn't have to neuter all dogs we proved that dogs are useful and who is to look after them. If not us, then who will make sure that the dog has the enough qualities to be a drug detecting dog? The dog that finds people in the rubble when there is an earthquake. And now I will say something and perhaps perhaps you will be upset with it. But I said, I'm so glad we had the earthquake because the dogs saved tons of people. And they demonstrated before all of Mexico how effective they are. And I said to these people at the Senate, do you see? Who do you think will promote and foster selective breeding of the dogs that help human beings in rescue missions, fighting drug cartel, drug dealing and in everything that they do and on top of that we have assistant dogs for the differently able people who were differently able were here they came here and it was really the best thing that could happen to us having this and having that there was a, a bitch you saw in the park She's behind the, the picture that was just put up. And this is Frida that I am talking about. And I have the army here who will not let me lie. But Frida, Frida found, found and saved more than 30 people. People who were buried in the rubble. And then they saw that with this, we just justified 
all of the rest of the functions because not only are they good for detecting drugs or rescuing people, but all the rest, all of the rest, human beings get benefits from dogs and we have the obligation to preserve their health, their well-being and the selective breeding because people say, and this is something that was put out here, they say, do not buy, adopt. I, I think somebody here put that here, and it says, don't buy, adopt. I mean, yes, but when you do that, and when you finish with these dogs, in Mexico, it is very common for the, for the following thing to happen. Stray dogs have an owner. The thing is, the owner cannot afford having the dog, and then they open the door for the dog to just go out and find something to eat wherever the dog can. And a lot of people feed them, they give them food, and even feed companies, feed companies do it as well. They put, they put food in the street and they give them water, but the dog comes back home at night and he's the guardian of the household. We also register here dogs. The dogs that are not, that don't have a breed, or we give them a certificate that is a certificate for the shows. We do agility tests and all sorts of tests with them. We help delegations nurture dogs that students will be benefited from. Not by carrying out the surgery themselves because they don't know how yet, but what we call the shadow teacher. The shadow teacher is the one who has the students near, near them. They see how they operate and we do between 10 to 15 dogs a day. 10 dogs, five cats. We do all of this, and this is what saved us from this problem. Today, you see you have Frida here as an example. And they come looking for Labradors that they want to use them for the service. I communicated it well at the meeting we had in the Americas and the Caribbean. We did it, and many countries have problems because they copied from other countries in Europe where they say it is forbidden to breed. And governments generally tend to copy and they want to do it, but they don't know how. They don't even know what they are doing. Most of you here perhaps have seen in Mexico a video of a place that unfortunately was very close to us in Ajusco. Let's say 20, 15, 20 kilometers here, we have a seven hectare place where there is a park. And right next to it, there was a place where in that place, they put all the animals they took from the circus all the lions, the tigers. I mean, those, those of you here who know, please, just by show of hands, raise your hands, those who got to see what I'm talking about there in Ajusco. Just have a look. They're over there, the ones who saw. It's not a lie. Well, the animals weren't fed. They were ill. They were malnourished. And so many institutions from the United States would donate large amounts of money to this foundation so that they would look after the animals. Ladies and gentlemen, this money was never seen by the animals. People stole the money and they never did anything. Lo lamento mucho, Dr. Pairo, pero nos quedan unos pocos minutos, así que por favor, si podemos seguir con las preguntas. I'm sorry, I just, uh, one second. I talked about Mexico, but now I am talking about the Americas and the Caribbean. There are several countries that have had major problems, and, they, and it was very hard for them. 
Miguel, he had a problem, but he knew how to manage with the government. We have to show them what happens. Anyway, that is what I felt like saying. We have many representatives here of the Americas and the Caribbean, and we are here for you. Thank you. Okay, my second question is um, with regards to... With regards to legislation, which is the other buzzword, obviously, so could you share with us some of the legislation um, involvement or efforts that are being made in your section, uh, or how you could get involved in legislation or lead it from a section level? Uh, as I said, from a section level, we have very diverse countries. Um, we have the rich, the poor, and the very poor. And um, the rich, I mean Australia, New Zealand, and Japan don't need much help because, of course, BOAS will help them a lot if they start following the BOAS system, they start using it, it'll be good. But for us, poor countries, we really need to, um, to help with desexing the dogs, the strays, because the only way to eliminate or to to stop the growth of all these stray dogs is by desexing them. Because these dogs, as Dr. Pilo said, these dogs have owners, but they go out for food at night and people feed them. Then they, get, they go in season and they get mated. They come home and they give birth. Then they have five more dogs and it's the same thing again. So it's a vicious cycle. So I think desexing the dogs or trying to control the the strays will be a big will be a big impact in our countries, including Africa. Thank you. Um, in Europe, we have very rich countries, rich countries, not so rich countries, and totally no rich countries. That means that the countries who are good in the money, let's say it on this way. They can do it very much, and they do it. They do it. They, they do searching. They hire high uh, educated uh, veterinarians, scientificists to solve problems in their kennel clubs, to solve the problems in their country. And there are also countries, and I do the sa same opposite side, who have not even 10 euro to spend for this kind of things. This is where we should find each other, because this is what we can do for each other. Because if we want, I hear a lot of times, the FCI is like one family. I love this, but let's see that we are a family. Because if my brother is in the problems, I will help him. I will not happy with him, but I will help him. And I think this is also the will of a lot of countries in Europe. They have the power, they have the possibilities, and they like to share. They have no problems to share. They don't say, from, we want to keep it for only for ourselves. They want to share. Only we have it not yet on this way. Because if I, in Europe we're talking a lot of the Western, the Southern, and the Eastern countries. And I love them all. But there is a big difference because these Western countries, there is the money. There is also always starting the problems. This is also true. There's always starting the, if there's starting, there's there, the problem starting. But they try to find the way to avoid these problems with a lot of information. Um, the heck, I'm going to talk about uh, the RSE. The Netherlands did take it over. They saw it and they said, hey, this is a good way. And we contact them and said, how you do it and how we can use it. And we use it in the same way. And so is the possibility there. If you go to a country and if you ask to the country, then this we can do it. So in the case of Europe, I, I say from it is excellent range in a lot of countries, but we could share our, um, our knowledge with a lot of countries who have not the power for this to do. 
Okay, earlier I, I went through some objective measures of welfare and compared to the 1970s. But I want to I want to go from there. From that from that whole talk, you might think, well, they're doing really well. AKC's got it easy, right? These numbers are really good. Uh, very few strays, much, much fewer number of dogs going into shelters, and a huge decline in euthanasia. But the truth is, that's wrong, right? We don't have it easy, and, and it's not, we are not done for two reasons. I mean, one is we, the dog people, are not going to be satisfied with where we are on improving health and welfare. But another fact that I am certain of is that the animal rights people will never be satisfied with whatever level of improvement we make because their goal is to not have pet dogs. So just, we have to remember that. So no, no matter how hard you work, this is the depressing part, how hard you work to make things better, you have to always keep working. You have to fight every day. And I know the question's about legislation, but so specifically about legislation, you know, unfortunately, we have politicians and pet owners who are all too easily persuaded by the feeling, trying to feel compassionate on an issue and approve or start to approve a law that would actually be bad for dogs, bad for dog ownership, or bad for breeders. And every day we have to fight that fight. And we fight it in the United States across thousands, you know, uh, actually um, tens of thousands of cities, towns, counties, states, not just one level of government. We have to fight this everywhere. This year alone, so far this year, we've already opposed more than 2,000 bills or laws that would either, things like mandatory spay-neuter, limit laws, anti-breeder bills, um, bills against certain breeds, breed-specific legislation. And that fight goes on every day. And I just want to remind everybody something I, I, I know I said it earlier, but the truth is that fight isn't all you have to do, right? We can't win by just fighting animal rights. And we can't win by expecting the government to get rid of all the unscrupulous, unlicensed, uneducated breeders. We win by winning the conversation by teaching breeders to breed better dogs, by driving health care, by improving the health of our dogs, and by improving our, the way the public sees us. And all of that takes time and investment and patience and cooperation. So. Talking about legislation, here we have had several times attempts of legislation and some laws have been passed because you know that in Mexico our history, our history has used animals for several things that most likely would be even against their welfare. For example, donkeys load donkeys, carrying donkeys. People mistreat them because they use them in little towns to carry their loads, massive loads most of the times. Cockfighting. Cockfighting, which unfortunately is a part of our, our idiosyncrasy as Mexicans, in which we have that as a part of our history. Attending cockfighting and you have famous singers performing there. Or bullfighting. We inherited that from Spain. And this is very, very hard to eradicate because they would have to sacrifice the bull and people will complain and whatnot. So we haven't been able to, to have a law um, a proper law, and then in the government they realized they would invite extremists of animals, so they would really 
they were seeking to exterminate and end dogs and cats and other animals just because they say they suffer. You know, just like right now, where in Germany they say that the Cholos Quinkler cannot compete because it suffers because it doesn't have hair. The Cholos Quinkler in this land has been around before even the Spaniards, and the Spaniards just turned 500 years old. The, the dog is the logo of our federation. But what good has it been? Why isn't there a law? Why haven't we had a law? Because of the huge amount of problems with regulations. And just see here. I think Dinky was speaking about the people of her country, but in Mexico we're 130 million Mexicans, and there are 50 million people living in poverty. Slightly lower than half but 50 million poor people. And let me tell you something. When the law, when they tried to pass the law against, against dog breeds, because they went against the breeds, they said that straight dogs would be the ones that needed to be save, saved. But guess what? When people were prohibited, there was a demonstration from the Mon National Monument, Angel de la Independencia, to the Sokolo Square Plaza. Millions of people, of people with their dogs went out and said, if you want to take our dogs away from us, first you will have to kill us because the dog is my companion. The dog goes the dog helps my unable children they help the elderly who do not have anyone to talk to and the dog is their sole companion well you wouldn't even begin to imagine the trouble that it was they had to drop it for the sake of peace they haven't been able to manage and right now they are inviting me at the senate we we were invited at the senate the K9 Federation and the veterinarian organizations to help them figure it out in a sensible way for the well-being for the welfare of animals. Mexicans love dogs. That is the reason why we have so many. And someone who cannot afford one, you might say, well, but this person has five or ten dogs. So it is even harder to educate them. My proposal was, ladies and gents, in order to pass a law, we have to educate people. The problem is not the dog, but the owners of the dogs are the problem, or the tutors, like we call them now, the tutor or the, of the dog. If the mister here doesn't uh, doesn't have the money to feed the dog and he opens the door for the door for the dog to go eat where the leftovers of restaurants or houses or just the trash and all that first of all we have to educate and then once they are educated we might be able to do something about the welfare and health of our beloved dogs but like i said we have to fight Every day we're fighting, and we have to fight like they do at four paws. It is a struggle, an ongoing struggle for life. But this is for everything. This is not just for this. This is fighting for everything we want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for two questions from the audience. So does anyone have any questions that would like to direct? It doesn't have to be for all of them. You can direct to one person or you can direct to all of them. Any questions from the audience? No, you're good. Any of the people on the front row? Questions? Ah, OK. There's a gentleman at the back. Perfect.
Thank you very much for this Congress. It was it was excellent. I just have a little suggestion here. Maybe we should have categories that are non-existent in dogs, but they exist in cats, which is premier. Since we have so many neutered dogs, we should think about the premier category of, of dogs. The premier category, for those who don't know, is for neutered dogs, both male and female. And would any of you would like to take that on? Uh, um, based on the FCI statutes, we only allow um, entire entire dogs to be shown. So um, we cannot allow neuter dogs to be shown based on the statutes of FCI because these dogs show are showing are being shown are eventually bred. So we cannot show neuter dogs as of this moment. Correct, Eve? At AKC, uh, neuter dogs can participate in all of our, almost all of our sports except confirmation and uh, some performance events. The issue comes up from time to time, and there are people who advocate for that, but there is a concern. You know, we, confirmation is about breeding stock, is an opportunity for judges to give feedback to breeders. Uh, it is not a beauty contest, and we have to work, we have to be careful with that because, again, back to our friends, the politicians, that we change what a confirmation dog show is, it could actually erode our ability to defend what we do. However, there is one interesting idea that has come up recently, and that is senior dogs, like dogs that are over a certain age, to be able to come back into the ring, uh, maybe champions of merit already, and they are neutered or spayed to let them back into the ring, which is because they're no longer, they're higher than average breeding age, that might be palatable, but that there's nothing, that is not actually happening, it's just an idea that has been proposed. I want to remind you of something about what he said. The FCI has a very specific function, and we all need to know about it. Promoting pure breeds for the service of ourselves. So a dog that is in the street is, like, is a dog like any other, of course, but the selection that needs to take place to determine the characteristics of smell for it to be a retrieving dog, a smelling dog, a hunting dog, a a tracing dog or an assistant dog, whatever you want. These are genes that need to take place, that need to exist in order to make breeds. This is a function of FCI and our function as well. We could invent all, all other services and tests that you can think of, but not the one for breed selection because having do show dogs, like Mark said, they are this is an, they are in beauty contests they are confirmation contests and everything that marks a standard on what Jorge Nale works all around the world just to make the standards for each breed and to make sure they abide by these standards you cannot have just any dog and be there where they don't have the phenotypical characteristics for the competition. It is not a competition. It is just that the, dog, the judge will choose the best specimens to serve our functions, to serve human beings, to serve what we have done. So we have to be thankful truly with organizations such as the FCI and like all the Kennet clubs that shouldn't disappear even if there are people saying so because we look after pure breed dogs that are used for x or y purpose that is the very reason why we exist thank you thank you, thank you so much yeah. okay so with that i'd just like to thank our panelists for um for participating in in uh, our Thank you for your, for your time. Sorry, we, we, we are not able to take any more questions. Sorry, guys. Um, we can maybe approach them later and, and talk directly to them. 
Um, so thank you again, and we'll carry on with the rest of the program for today. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the dogs worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate in this great event. Thank you.